You're now live. It says live. It says feel... we're live. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah, I feel live. That's I'm good. To, I'm trying oh. to button up my shirt. There we go. All right. Connie B says hi. Hi, Connie. Why don't? Oh, hi, Connie. Who hi. else is out there? Say hi. Let us know. Let us know who's out there in the world. Uh, we love to hear where you're watching from, <laughs> and if you have any furry friends with you. Nice to hear about them too. How are you doing today, Dad? Were you working on your book? I was. Was it a productive morning? Um, it was. Yeah, I got a jolt when the the publishers wrote me and said, "How's the book coming on?" Meaning, you're a year behind deadline. Uh huh. So I, yeah, uh, but I've been working on it every day, starting six thirty a.m. and working through till three four or five well done well done and, um yeah it's i'm such a slow writer it's taken i mean i started this i think three years ago i started it at the farm i remember sitting outside a little wooden table with a chair because that was the best wi-fi reception on the farm mm. you know because uh all the everything works by wi-fi these days in the field so you get better reception in the fields than you do in the old house it's a different world we live in yeah but all right, we got some friends to say hi to jacqueline whoa look at that it's uh it's a familiar face hi, jacqueline. Um, rebecca says hi from st louis yeah i know so many australian cattle dogs named indy hello from vermont oh hi duke you come to watch Michigan. we're very um so far very uh very united states i feel like often we're a little more international well, Your australia was it? oh no yeah oh here we go berlin germany oh yeah garrison we got some Ooh. got some doggies in the audience cattle dog i'm just gonna shut the door hang on sounds good jacqueline's got her uh Bat and hound and a mutt. Wonderful, wonderful. So this Have was these dogs. Jacqueline Carr. Woohoo! Hello. Yeah, there's a, a lot of people already here because uh, I I figured out how to schedule it in advance. Yeah. So yes, this was there was a little notice on our Facebook feed saying we'll be going live at three p.m. on Thursday. So uh, Brazil. Camila. Uh, Camila says a new book. Yes, Ian's working on a new book. I'm sure the publisher must be very used to people being behind deadline. That seems like a, a common thing. Yeah, but, you know, this was, well, I, mean, we had, I, I had two years of COVID, you know, and I, I did a lot of work on it, but it it's such a different, conceptually different, that I kept changing my mind about how to say it. Yeah. Um. It's very hard to mention things that you think are wrong, but say it in a nice way. Huh? <laughs> I mean, I could probably do it in three seconds in one sentence if I really were unplugged. Right, right. I, I had some practice with that when I was making um, multiple choice questions for some of our courses where you want to write something that sounds plausible, but is clearly wrong, but, you know, doesn't doesn't sound wrong sounds like it might be right but um all right that's probably enough chit chat let's get to it okay straight in potatoes. um i will just briefly say before we jump into today's webinar the uh reliable rocket recalls that if you want to learn more about um what we're discussing today we've got lots of videos seminars demos and all that in the top dog academy and if you want you can even Join the Top Dog Academy today and check it out for yourself for free with a free one month trial. I bet we have some people in the audience who are already Top Dog Academy members. Anybody out there already a Top Dog Academy member? Oh yeah. I can um, see so yeah. the names. If you want to check it out and uh, that's all we'll say about it for now. Except what does it mean if they have a little red sort of? Little red means they are watching on YouTube. And little oh. blue means they're watching on Facebook. Oh well, YouTube wins out. Good Lord. I don't know. It's yeah. 
on the basis yeah. of this, I'm selling my shares on Facebook and buying YouTube. Lisa's a member. I maybe Farms is a member. Maybe Instagram and TikTok instead. Um, Chris Garrison's a member. Okay, uh, enough of that. Um, on, let's get to let's it. Get to it. So today we're talking about reliable rocket recalls. How to get your dog to come when called uh, reliably and promptly. Um, so I thought we would start this webinar with uh, with a story. I know that you, Dad, have many stories of various training exploits in your life. Do you remember what story you're going to tell, or do you need a? Oh uh, yes, I remember the Doberman in 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 Italy in um, to, uh, Tokyo, Japan. Yeah. Oh, yes. Before you jump into it, I will just say uh, we'll do a Q and A at the end. We'll probably, this uh, presentation part of the webinar last about an hour. So around four o'clock, we'll probably start taking questions. If you have like a clarifying question about what's happening, what we're talking about right now, you could post that in the comments and we might address it. We might, might not, but um, we'll be taking questions from everyone at the end. So if you have questions you want to ask, the end will be the time. Yeah, and I'd like to say, so you have a, a good ad to think about it. Um, in the question, right up front, state what is your dog doing that you consider to be uh, wrong? And um, it's pretty obvious what um, we all want our dogs to do when we're talking about recalls to move from point A, wherever they are, to point B, sitting directly in front of us, no matter where they are, how far away, or what they were doing. So, um, just clearly state what it is. Try and rule out all other sort of interesting facts. But as far as I'm concerned, dogs are dogs. To me, all breeds of dogs are dogs. I'm going to train them the same way anyway, whether it's a basset or a bauble. So, all right. So, story. So, yeah, I had the I, this TV program in um, Japan which turned out to be the most watched program ever on Japanese TV. Um, and not because of me, it was an existing program with a pop group called Tokyo with an I, uh, it was a boy band, but they did everything the old Japanese way. So everyone liked them, you know, young folk liked them because it's a boy band and the old people liked them because they were very traditional in what they did, you know, agriculture, uh, carpentry, making pottery, and training a dog so they had this dog and um a shiba inu and the producer came up with an idea to have me as the host and like it's my dog training company which of course doesn't exist dr Trian dunbar's training company and one of the band members had been my assistant and we had this incredible band member who no matter what he did with dog he could get any misbehavior out of a dog. He'd get the worst out of any dog just by being there, you know, which is very difficult when you're a trainer to get the behavior problem on cue because the dog takes one look at you and thinks he's looking at me. I'll, I'll sit. Okay. What next? You know? Yeah. Anyways, that'd be very handy for us to have around someone who could bring out the misbehavior. Yeah. So I, I go in the house in the morning, a very big apartment for Tokyo and it was trashed. And they show me things the dog had eaten, like a framed picture of their baby, a few fragments of glass yet, and one, one edge of the frame. It chewed the couch, everything. So, you know, I brought out the old stuffed Kongs, put them on the ground, like, end a problem. The dog, they looked at it and said, this dog has never laid down calmly in its life. And then we played some Kong games, find your Kong, fetch your Kong, stuff like that. So we wrapped early. I said, well, we won't, um, you know, we can go home early now and we'll start tomorrow at 6 a.m. And I thought, oh, my word. And doing what? Oh, recalls in the dog park. So I thought, ah, piece of cake, you know, most Tokyo dog parks about the size of your living room. And uh, anyway, I get there at 6 a.m. I'm pretty groggy eyed. And I looked at this park and I thought, oh, my word, you know, it's only about. 70 yards across but it goes for miles in both directions i mean this is a big park so i asked a few questions and said well you know how many times has your dog been here they say oh never i said well how many times has your dog been to a dog park never uh, have you ever had him off leash apart from your apartment never and i look at this doberman and he looks back at me and i think well this is going to be really funny 
And so I said, well, look, what we're going to do is let the dog off leash. I'm going to have the owners try and call the dog because it won't work. So that way we get the problem on cue. And it was hilarious. The wife was very funny. She had a baby less than a year old. And at one point and she's saying, you know, Doberman, come, come. And she goes to grab it and sort of tosses her baby like a rugby ball to the husband who clasps it. And she dives on the ground. I mean, she really was a good actress. So we got this good footage. And then I said, I'm going to get a cup of coffee and I'll be back in about 45 minutes to an hour. And that's when training should begin. And they said, you, you're going away. I said, oh, yes, we have to wait 45 minutes after the dog's been in the park, like I'd done this before, you know. And I come back. The dog is running from length to length like this. And this dog is so happy. He's like a gazelle, the way he's going. You know, zoom, 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 like that. And I, I knew there was no way I was going to get any attention from the dog. I tossed a couple of treats. He totally missed them. I mean, you know, he's a Doberman. And so I thought, looked around, and there was this little beagle watching me. And when I threw a treat, he went, no, oh, I see that, trots up to it in true beagle fashion, sniffs around, eats the treat, and looks at me. So I went, yo, beagle. And he comes waddling up. He's really fat. And I gave him a treat. Then I backed up, come sit, treat, come sit, treat, come sit, treat, and then come sit down and all sorts of stuff. And then back into heel, heel sit, heel sit, come sit, come sit. And the Doberman noticed this because his owner is standing behind me and I'm praising and giving lots of treats. So he comes close and I told people, don't even attempt to grab at it, which they did once and then the dog ran off. But the dog's getting closer and closer and eventually he saw her treat come his way. And so he sort of takes it. Well, I move back because you stand there, he'll be very cautious and then back off. So I move back, toss another treat, toss another treat, then one over his head. So he has to increase the distance. Then a couple of tasty treats between him and me till he comes very close. Then I wind him around my body like this and pull it like behind my back. So his neck like presses against my leg. And then I grab him, hook my finger through his collar and say, gotcha, treat, 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 treat. And that gotcha means not I've got to collar. It means I own your brain now. Mm. Yep. And I gave him about six or seven treats. And then I walk off from him really quickly. And he sort of looks up and starts trotting towards me. So I keep walking away from him. And then I squat down with my arms like this. And he comes up and I toss treats, come in, ba bomb. Anyway, it gets better and better. You know, I keep walking away from him and then squatting down. He comes in. I bring him around to my side. So he can't see my hand, take his collar. Gotcha. Treat, treat. Go play. And then I move off. And after about, oh, just 10 minutes, I would say, go play and run off. And he would run after me. And then eventually a few more trials on, he would run after me and sit and let me take his collar, give him a treat, go play. At that point, the treat is no longer the real reward. It's no longer necessary. We say, sit off, take it, good dog, go play. So we can power up the treat as a mega secondary reinforcer for use indoors or in other scenarios, because eating the treat is always followed by going play, which was the problem, which is now the huge reward to amp up the piece of kibble and to reinforce the dog for coming and sitting. And in essence, you know, in one sentence, what you've got to do to have a truly reliable recall is to make every single potential distraction in the environment the reward for coming to you when called. So you've got to set it up that that dog will eventually come to you in the dog park. So you can then give him a treat, pat him on the head and say, go play. It's the come here, go play, come here, go play. And every time you call him, you can say, go play more. And every dog comes. I mean, I've had people sitting in front of me. I mean, it cracks me up when people present the history of their problem. He says, he never comes when called. He's impossible. I mean, in the dog park, I just, I can't catch him. I said, what, another dog at home or, or this one? Oh, this one. 
I said, well, when do you last go to the dog park? I said, well, we did it before we came here because I wanted him to be tired out and relaxed, you know. I said, so you went to a dog park this morning. So you caught him. <laughs> so you got him. You see, that's when training should begin. But what nearly every dog owner does when they catch their dog, put him on leash, take him home. They give the dog the biggest punishment in domestic dogdom for coming back to the owner. Yeah, I love this story so much because it flips the whole concept on its head. You know, it's kind of like your your story about, you know, or your your technique about you stuff a chew toy in front of your dog and put it inside the crate, lock the door with the dog outside. Yeah. You make the dog want the thing. You, by, by making it so they can't have it, you make them want it more. You know, like by playing hard to get with the dog in the park, they want to now pursue you. You're not trying to chase them all over the park and get their attention with a a tasty treat or a toy you're waiting until they're like oh what's up with my owner like you know they want your attention because eventually they're going to want your attention yeah and and we're actually going to do a few i call that more murphy's law and dog training we're going to do a couple of those today to improve the recall but i i actually love often when i'm talking to a dog and he's the, the ones that you know you tell them to come and they just stand at a distance and look at you mm -hmm. And then they do a play bow and then they run like idiots. I think, okay, buddy, you know, uh, it's on, it's on. Um, I bet I can apply Murphy's law in dog training and you will eventually come to me. And when you come, I'll chase you. You know, we know what's happened at home, right? So yeah, it's finding out that, you know, what is it that keeps the dog at a distance? And of course it could be the owner. It could be, you know, after recall, bad things happen, whether benignly, training ends um, or uh, overtly. You know, I've seen it, I just wrote it in my book, a, a sequence I saw at a dog park, oh, 20, 30 years ago, when this person's calling this dog, screaming at it, when it comes in, oh man, she lays into this dog, she puts the leash on, she's screaming, shouting, she's jerking it, she walks two steps, then she does it again, she walks a few more steps and then whops on it a few times. So you know, dogs have two good reasons not to come when called. Uh, we hope the reason is not you. We just hope the reason is the distractions out there. Why? Because you can convert them all into rewards to use for training. Mm -hmm. The other uh, nugget, nugget out of that that I feel like so easy for people to do that most people do not do, take the collar, treat, 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 go play. And that, that's it. You know, and then and walk it. away and be like, all right, uh, that, that's all I wanted to do. And it gets easier from then. The hardest time is to take the collar the first time. But then you say, go play. And the dog builds confidence now every time he comes to you because he's learning that going to you is not the end of the training session, the play session or the end of the world. It's just time for a short refreshment break, a quick massage, and then back into the fray again, you know, to play with other dogs. Mm hmm. So um, uh, Heidi asks, do you always book an extra long session with a client for these ones and bring a coffee with you? And I would say you ended up being in a situation where you knew you were going into a, a really bad scenario where you're not going to have any luck initially. So rather than waste your time at first, but that you don't have to do it this way, you could set it up in a way that you would start productively. Yeah. Yeah. I, in Japan, I needed far more than a coffee. I, 6 a.m., I tell you, I was not functioning. I just needed 30 minutes sitting on my own with no noise. Um, no, usually I, I, walk, I chat to the owner walking to the dog park, and I'm watching them, and I watch them how they release the dog and that, and then when they let the dog go, I just chat to them for keeping an eye on the dog. Could be 10 minutes with some dogs, could be 40 minutes, but I chat to them. It's not like... I haven't <laughs> got much to say. I love chatting to them. And, you know, it's like every dog I work with, it's like now it's it's one of my dogs, you know, and I want it to do well and I want the owner to be happy with it. So, yeah, I, and I wouldn't take coffee to a dog park because then in 30 minutes I'd be looking for a toilet. So, so um, before we jump into kind of... Too much like information, breaking, I know, Jamie. <laughs> breaking down... Uh, some easy exercises for people to start with. I think you touched on this a little bit, but um, I'm sure there are many people out there who have, are going to have this this question. 
And uh, so we should might as well just address it up front. What are suggestions for non-food motivated dogs? Um, well, either you train the dog to like food, like I said, you see, food is so easy and so convenient and you're going to give it to the dog anyway, especially if it's kibble. It's so silly that you haven't converted it into the best secondary reinforcer in the world. And so the way we do that is we say, sit, take it, play tug, sit, eat the kibble, uh, play fetch. Like I'm not going to throw the tennis ball till the dog eats a bit of kibble. I've had dogs out in the yard here, like they do this and I put it in their mouth and they just lower their head and it drops out. I've seen dogs spit it while I'm not throwing the ball. Um, sit, eat the kibble on the couch. Sit, eat the kibble, have a chest rub, a tiny rug, you know. Whatever the dog likes, um, you eat the kibble first because it's so valuable. If you don't understand that, as most people don't. I mean, how many times have I explained it, Jamie? How many people do it? Very few. And so then I'd say, well, use something else. It, with most dogs, you know, I just use my normal silly self. I can be, I, Jamie says I have to do TikTok and Instagram. So I've been just, yeah, working on a few routines and trying it out um, with Duke, who's a dog in residence at the moment. And I was just saying, tell me, Duke, what do you think about the present political situation? And he was like, and I mean, amazing facial expression. So I want to have dialogues with dogs, which is what uh, I do always. You're going to be a natural at TikTok, Dad. Just, let's hope. You're, let's you were made hope. for it. Okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, let's jump in to, uh, if, if you don't want to start in the worst possible training scenario, for people who want to start, you know, something easy, get, get a few wins under their belt, what would you suggest? Yeah, the best possible training scenarios. I'm going to do this back to front. We got reliable rocket recalls. So I interpret that as reliability given any distraction uh, at great speed. And then the basic concept of a recall. So let's start off with the recall. And I'll run through a few exercises very quickly. I like the one step here, uh, come sit routine. You take one step backwards, that's all. Come sit that when you're training any sequence of behavior, you always start with the last step. Like if you're learning a poem, start with the last line. I mean, how many first lines of songs and poems do you know? Yeah, because that's what happens when we learn. And so when you're reciting a poem, you're working to your point of incompetence or failure, if you like. Whereas if you learn the last line first and the last two lines, last three, you get over your nerves and you spit out the first line. Well, the second one comes easier and the third and the fourth. Yeah. So that's the process. I want come sit to be an absolute reflexive action for the dog. So we must do this off leash. Um, you never train a dog on leash. You know, if you need it on leash, um, then just put the leash on your trained dog. But all training, whether recalls, healing, stays, you want to do off-leash. Otherwise, the leash will become a crutch and a leash jerk or a tug or a pull or a hold will become a, a knee-jerk reaction. So off-leash, one step, come sit. Do 50 reps in a row. And you can start off, come sit, kibble. Come sit, kibble. Come sit, kibble. But then we move into asking more for less. That a lot of the, in this book, I, I have written down, you know, what lure reward training is. I mean, I've never really written it down. I mean, I guess um, how to teach new dog old tricks is the best, you know, incarnation of it, if you like. But that's like, what, 30 years old, that book? And so when writing it down, I think the bits people miss is step one is go cold turkey on the lure. Phase it out totally. You never want food in your hand before the behavior, at least not for long. So come, lure, the dog sits, food reward. Come food lure, dog sits, food reward. Then come by the sixth trial, I'm gonna do come here, sit, with an empty hand, 
feed it from this one. Get the lure out of your hand, phase that out. Now I want to decrease the number of food rewards because it, it, it's crazy these days. Everything a dog does, food treat, food treat, come food treat, roll over food treat, high five food treat. It's you're demotivating the dog and you're devaluing the food treat. And so we want to be um, more modulating in our praise for each of these short come sits and very judicious in our food reward. And we want to see how many come sits can we get for a single reward. So we work out the, rea the ratio, the come sit to food reward ratio. So we start off one to one for about four or five repetitions. Then can we go come sit, come sit, food reward? Well, you can do that. I bet you can do come sit, come sit, come sit. I'll tell you something. Your daughter already can do come sit, come sit, come sit, come sit, come sit for food reward. That's 10 behaviors to one reward. So I want it to be totally reflexive whether there's no food, you know, in your hand. At that point, I would put the food on a table in the middle of the room. This is what I do in training class. The treat table, everyone, is on the table in the middle of the room. Do not have food treats on your person. You may take them one at a time to use as a lure and or to give as a food reward. And I want to count how many you give. And that's the only way to get people to thin it out. Otherwise, it will become bribing. Most dogs these days are bribed. And so occasionally we ask them to come. They don't come. Why come? What's the benefit? You know, I'll wander up when I'm ready. They give me three treats. What's the benefit of me coming now when I'm sniffing uh, another dog's rear end? So it's got to be reflexive. So once you can get 10 or 20 come sits in a row, that's 20 or 40 behaviors for a single piece of kibble that's on the table over there, you, we're getting somewhere. Now go for two step come sits and then three step and four steps. So now we're going to gradually increase um, distance and then five steps and 10 steps. And where are we doing this? Indoors. I mean, why make a fool of yourself in the park where the dog doesn't come? You practice in the privacy of your own home. Oh, Dad, we know you love to make a fool of yourself in public. I have no shame, I must admit. But I, I do appreciate that you're trying to uh, consider other people. I'm helping. Uh, LP, you know, not everyone has no shame. And very have, empathic of you. I have no fear of making a fool of myself in public, in a training class, in a dog park or on TV, because I've done it so many times, I know the dog is going to do it. I've had dogs that have blown me off for the longest time. I've had dogs that have literally nearly ripped my clothes off in a training workshop. But in the end, they did it and we created extra magic because everyone saw how bad they were. So, you know, and my one, you know, I think stellar skill of a trainer is, I guess I do think about it a lot, but I never give up. I, I, I think, you know, I say, Mr. Dog, this is not really difficult, you know. Here's the deal. I have a bag of piece of kibble on the table there, and I will give them to you. And by the way, unless you work this out already, that is your dinner. So if you do want to have dinner tonight, we can start off with an amuse-bouche one at a time. But you will come to me and sit before you get that. And, I, you know, I think I'm not going to, not stressing the dog. I'm, I'm never going to hurt him or frighten him, I hope. But you are going to do it. So off leash, indoors, then outdoors, in your yard. And then some friends' yards. And then other fence places. Do you know anyone who's got a tennis court or a corral or, or what have you? So you want to practice in as many fenced outdoor settings as possible. Then we're going to invoke Murphy's Law in dog training. If your dog won't come when called, then let's do start with some uh, come sits and then some yo-yo recalls. That means you're sending the dog to another person, two of you. You say, Rover, go to Jamie. And Jamie says, Rover, come here. And when the dog comes, sit, takes his collar. Good dog. Go to dad without giving the treat. Well, now the dog doesn't want to leave Jamie. Especially if Jamie is wagging the treat in his hand like this. So I say, Rover, come here till the dog zips back and forth. 
Uh, then we teach the dog to go to particular people. Go to Jamie, okay? Go to uh, Lily or whatever. And so you're sending the dog away from you. Then we play fetch and find. You see, these are wonderful games, fetch, find, and tug. They all give you a free recall because the fetch can't continue until the dog brings the object back and drops it in your hand. With Duke, who just came in earlier, I changed yesterday from bringing it back and dropping it on the ground was yesterday. Today, it's bringing him back and dropping it in my hand. And on the very last recall, which I said's the last recall, Duke, when he came back, I moved my hand under the toy box. And when he dropped it in my hand, I moved my hand away and the ball went in the toy box. So it's now drop it in my hand. And at the end of this, clear up your toys and put it in the toy box. So fetch, find and tug give you free recalls. But here's the biggie. Teach your dog a send out. So a send out is what they do in competitive obedience. And you send your dog out. It has to leave you in a dead straight line. And when you're ready, you say sit. And then it stops running and sits when it turns and faces you. As soon as you start trying to teach a send out, you'll find the dog won't leave you. It's amazing. And a send out is not a go to. A go to is you would say to go to the tree where you've dropped a food tree. You're sending him to a food tree. In a go to, the dog will move out quickly, then slow around when he starts to search for the treat or the toy or the person. Go to people in a park and the people are hiding behind trees. Okay, There's lots of these lovely games to play, which are Murphy's Law in dog training. And the harder it is to teach your dog to go to, um, to go and fetch something, to go and find something, to go to another person or just to go out. It's probably the most difficult of all obedience commands to teach, just running out. So that's the first thing. By then, the dog knows what a recall is. It means come and sit in front of the owner. Come and sit. But you only say come. The sit is automatic. So then we'd move on to the next stage. Let's see. Reliable rocket recalls. But we're doing it backwards. So uh, Bead. Rocket, rocketing. Bead. Yeah. So... <laughs> Differential reform. We want to let the dog know when I say come, in most instances, unless I tell you otherwise, like if I say, Rover, steady, come, steady, like you would say if your dog's off leash in a cocktail party, everyone's drinking red wine, you've got beige carpets. You don't want the dog to play skittles with your guests, okay? So you want it to come slowly. But normally, come means immediately, quickly, come and sit in front of me. So it helps if the dog knows what the, what the word quickly means. So I teach the dog the word quickly or hustle on cue. You can choose the word. Okay? It doesn't matter what the word is. It's what you've taught it to mean. I usually teach this when letting the dog to follow me. Okay. And again, this also will imbue um, centripetal attraction in the dog the the notion of wanting to stay close to you will improve your recall and so you do basic following exercises open field following trail following and what have you round chairs in the house like weaving poles while following from room to room like like the videos of zuzu on on um, dunbar academy and you know this is what i do on a regular basis when i'm at home and writing and can't think i say come on zoo and we do some silly following exercises or we turn on spotify and we dance together you know which is another great exercise to imbue that centripetal attraction, that psychological bungee cord. So the dog has a reason to be close to you. It wants to be close to you. Okay. So we teach hustle and steady when following or with the dog on leash. So we can actually do this outside on the sidewalk. I would go in a straight line and only back and forth in front of your house. 
you know, but you walk and then you say hustle and you accelerate fast you can. Only walking, don't don't jog or run, you know, just walking only. You speed up, you hit the accelerator, you put down the welly and then you say steady and you slow down. You, you just feather the brakes and then hustle, you speed up again. And I like three gears of walking or following, you know, which is slow, normal and fast. So the dog learns now that hustle or quickly means speed up. So now we can say this in a recall and let the dog know, Rover, come quickly, quickly. And when you say quickly, I would backpedal so fast to do silly things, make noises like a frog and whoop, 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 running away from the dog. So he thinks, what the hell's going on? I better get to him quickly before he has a fit or something or, or just to stop him to avoid any extra embarrassment. That always works with German shepherds. You know, they hate it when you're acting silly, right? Oh, I cannot believe I'm here with this guy. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, uh, oh, Schrechlich, I do not believe I'm here with this English fool. <laughs> so... Yeah, there's nothing like the English sense of humor, you know. It's like, it's so different in France and Germany, you know. Anyway, we move along. We're doing dogs, not um, yeah, national differences in senses of humor. So, teach, hustle, or steady. You've got to teach a word to speed up. Now let's invoke Murphy's Law. Practice slow recalls. We now have the latest new game in the canine games in Japan, it's the only country in the world now that has a National Canine Games League since, you know, I started it. Every year they have a playoff, and one of the games is the slowest recall. So 64 dogs start, okay, and it's the, the dog has to, when you say Rover, come, the dog has to cross the start line within two seconds. The judges go one Mississippi, two Mississippi, disqualified. If any part of their paw hasn't crossed the line yet then they're disqualified at the starting line then it has to move as slowly as possible in a narrow lane if it touches the lane border disqualified if it stops moving for a palpable second disqualified it then has to cross the finish line completely and the owner touches it on the head click time slowest dog to complete the recall goes through to the next round of two dogs racing at the same time so 32 in the next round then 16 8 4 and then we get down to the semi-finals of the slowest recall at the conference right and eventually the slowest dog and they love winning that prize because on the ribbon it says slowest recall and everyone thinks it's a joke for a bumbling dog and owner it ain't it's one of the hardest prizes to win so practice that. Then you can do what I used to do in my games workshops, which you can see on again on the Dunbar Academy if you look at the uh, fun and games workshop. We do a recall that starts off fast, but then you have to slow it down mid-recall, then speed it up. Okay, and we have the lines. And so it's like you have to imagine you've called the dog in the park and you look out, oh no, there's a children's picnic in the way. So the dog has to move in a straight line through the picnic and then come to you. So uh, since now, you it, since you mentioned, it, I will take the opportunity to say, if you'd like to see the reliability in games workshop that I believe you're alluding to in Dunbar Academy, you can for free with a free trial of the Top Dog Academy. Um, thank you, Jamie. Yeah, yeah. I Jamie is said to uh, have a word from our sponsors, aka <laughs> us, Dunbar Academy. Now, I should say, and I'm going to say this in a very different way. Um, we have a lot of subscribers to Dunbar Academy here. And we, uh, after COVID, we, oh man, we spent a lot of time, you know, serious puppy training closed down, 25 branches on one evening. And, you know, we're up and running now in the Bay Area. Um, but in that meantime, Jamie and Kelly hustled to produce um, online alternatives, whether live online, Zoom classes, um, or the Essential Puppy Training course. And that took about four months, five months of work, was it, Jamie? Six months? Yeah, six yeah. months with all the editing. We made over 170 videos for our new Essential Puppy Training course. It's all organized into five developmental stages 
because we wanted to be able to show, you know, the first step of an exercise when the puppy was nine weeks. And then we wanted to show that same exercise, how it looks, you know, when the puppy's 10 weeks and 12 weeks, because, you know, you're always progressing. We start in the, the studio, no distractions. Then we go in the backyard, few distractions. Then we go in the driveway, you know, people going by. So, so we have yeah. videos for everything I'm saying, right? So that's everything you're saying. Yeah. And so. I was engrossed in my book, but now Jamie and I had a chat just yesterday. We're at a different stage now in the business. We've got to get back to promotion. So this is a big please to all our subscribers out there. Please spread the word. If you enjoy it, and I sincerely hope you do, please tell all your doggy friends about it. I'm sure some of you do, but um, we're in the mode now of promoting. I like doing it personally. Jamie, on the other hand, will step in at every opportunity. And let me just tell you that that seminar is on Dunbar Academy. So, all right, here we go. Differential reinforcement. Basically, you've got to be modulating with your praise. You've got to change your praise. You, you can't, it's so difficult to change something if you're always giving the same feedback, like the same piece of kibble or the same click and the same tree. Your feedback should always be different. Why? Because the quality of the behavior is always different. And your praise should reflect that. Very, very occasionally now, you're going to give food rewards. One, maybe two, maybe three bits of kibble, maybe a little bit of cheese. You've got one of those in your pocket, or maybe a bit of steak. And dogs, I tell you, when you say to a dog, you know that was the best reward I've ever seen you do today. In fact, over the last week, so I'm going to look in my food pouch and I pretend I'm fumbling around. But I know the cheese and the steak are in a separate compartment because I only have one of those. I say, I've got it. What do you think it is? Cheese or steak? And the dog's like, like this. And I pull it out. Good dog. So that whole sequence there is, if you like, marking the behavior or extending the marker to the eventual reward, the talking to the dog. So you must start it instantly when you see the behavior, but you just chat to the dog about what's going to happen. I'm going to give you a good reward. <laughs> or maybe I'll eat it myself. Oh, God. Oh, oh, just kidding. Okay. You can have it. All right. So modulate praise, but give the reward sparingly. Uh, I would start off with, you never want the dog to get a reward for more than one out of three recalls. Never. Okay. And to um, clarify, you mean a, a food treat? I mean praise. Reward, right? Yeah, sorry, praise. Yeah. One out of three. So a third of the recalls will go you, unpraised. Yeah. A right third of the recalls will go unpraised. Yeah. Two thirds you are praising? A continuous reinforcement schedule does not exist at all in my training. It is the stupidest thing to do with an animal or a child. It's, it's theory. What's happened is this 100-year-old laboratory-created theory has poisoned our brain so we can't think. And we're doing, I, I, you know, oh, God, we got a, someone from a, 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 a dog training academy here who wants to train some dogs. And we got, and he's saying, well, I've had them on a continuous reinforcement for four days. So now I'm going to switch to a variable ratio. Re and I'm like, oh, my God, we're on a variable ratio reinforcement within two repetitions. At the beginning, the may, dog may get two bits of praise and treats for reward. No, thin it out. So never praise the dog more. Um, I just go, and we do another one. And just think about it. If you did 100 come sits or longer recalls, say, you know, 10 step come sits, 50% of them will be below medium in terms of quality, in this sense, speed. So you're going to reward slower the median recalls, this is insanity. Uh, but this is what the majority, 99% of dog owners are doing. It's insanity. So what uh, we would do instead, so... Well, uh, I mean, I think I think calling it insanity is maybe a, a bit uh, hyperbolic. I think it, it makes sense because, or it makes sense on a certain level because your dog came and that's what you asked them to do. 
and you want to reinforce that. And, and doesn't doesn't that make sense on a certain level? Uh, not in the training perspective, no. What you're doing is denaturing the tree. The dog will take it for granted it, it, because it immediately becomes a, a continuous schedule, you know. And so it's like if you give someone a pay raise at random, wow, they're amazing. And the next week too, but the third week they expect it. And the next time they're going to, you know, have any reaction is the first week you can't pay them because of COVID, say, or what have you, because of shutdown. So, no, a, a continuous reinforcement does not belong in training. See how right. quick... Again, because, again, again. You know, let let me explain. Of, what? Just in terms of it being an insanity, as you point out, like, that's how most people live their lives. They go to a job and they expect to get paid for showing up regardless of whether they do you know, their best day of work or their worst day of work, they usually get the same payment. So all I'm saying is, I'm not saying people should do it, but that it shouldn't be surprising that a lot of people think that's the way it should be. I, I would say insanity again. You've heard all my stuff about the entire world being maintained on continuous schedules, fixed interval and fixed ratios, you know, payday and peace rate. These are not motivating. Let's just say that it is not motivating so badly so that it's even demotivating and eventually you'll get slow recalls and then you'll get no recalls. And this is why I bet a good half of the people listening now want to hear this because they had a lovely recall and then it disappeared. And it's because you've been giving food. You've got a spoiled child of a dog. They don't appreciate money anymore. Don't appreciate the fact you bought a car. Everything's taken for granted, you know, because it, it's, it's very difficult to entrain uh, children to really see each day as a joy and the gifts that they have compared to other kids. Very easy to do it with a dog. But what you've got to do is stop overloading it with food rewards. Read the instructions in Lure Reward Training. Three stages. Stage one, phase out food lures, i.e. get food out of your hand, put it in your pocket. Stage two, greatly reduce the number of food rewards you give and replace it with much more powerful rewards like running away from you, being chased, playing with other dogs, sniffing butts, sniffing the grass, you know, all sorts of things out there. Games of fetch and tug, interactive games, or all the behavior problems that I reclassify as rewards by putting them on cue. And then when a dog does a good recall, if you say a cocker min pin cross, I say, come here. Whoa, speak. I let him bark. Whatever it is they want to do, there's usually an appropriate outlet for it. And we've got to incorporate it into, and I've got to move very quickly because I want to get this all out before the end of the hour. So how would we do a, a most sophisticated differential re reinforcement? I call it the DR 10, 20, 30. What I do is I do 10 recalls. So I first did this with a Bassett, whose owner wanted a speedy recall. So I timed 10 recalls over the same distance. And then I came up with the average amount of time the dog took. What was the dog average recall time? Then I worked out what was 10% better or quicker than average recall time, 20% quicker and 30% quicker. And then we went into training mode for the next five recalls, the dog had to at least be 10% quicker to get a food reward. Okay. 20% quicker to get two food rewards and 30% quicker to win a jackpot. I'm praising jumping up and down and giving him a really tasty bit of food. That just so happened that 10%, 20%, 30% meant I'm only rewarding one third of recalls which for me is the perfect learning schedule. After five recalls, we recalculate the average because it should be changing, right? <laughs> I mean, if this is training working. You'd, you'd yeah, hope so, this right? This is part of training. Every so many trials, you recalculate the dog's performance, the length of his sit stay or the recall time. So after every five recalls, I compute the average from the last 10. So I now get rid of the initial five. Then I do another five with the new set of 
times for 10% better, 20% better, 30% better. Okay, so it's a very simple process. I say it's described at length in um, science-based dog training with feeling. Um, so, but it's a very simple process to understand and it very quickly speeds up recalls. All right, let's move along now to reliability. And by this, I mean reliability in the face of any distraction, no matter what the dog is doing. Best possible training. Probably the part that really a lot of people need where that, you know, I've heard so many times, my dog comes in this situation perfectly. It's only this other situation where it doesn't work. So Yeah, and there's two things about that. One, well, let's just say one. It's just not true. When someone says to me, my dog only behaves in this situation, I think, you're wrong. Or if you're right, it'll change in a couple of days. So your dog only bites angry men who have beards and black hats on and carry a cane. That's the start of it. Soon they'll bite all tall men, then all men. Then we'll have a go at a little boy. You know, it's, it's, there's it, never and always do not exist in dog behavior. Behavior is always in a state of perpetual flux. Did you, did you catch what you did, what you did there? What? You said never and always have no place. In oh, always. Behavior is always in a state of flux. Yeah, I have a better one than that. I once said never say never. Right. <laughs> and, and I've said never say no. Don't say no. Usually I, say sometimes. Yeah, I know. Anyway, there we go. So best possible training scenario. Let's do it simply. You start in your home, house and yard. Uh, then you bring in another person, then a few other people, okay, who can act as distractions, but they're distractions under your control. Then we bring it, do it in your home and yard with another dog present, or a number of dogs present. Then we do it with the dogs off leash, while your dog's doing recalls. You, you just do it. I call this the force in dog training. You know, in a, in a puppy class or on my English TV program, you probably find it in those, you know, Dunbar Redux things we have hidden somewhere. God knows where they are in Dunbar Academy. But I say, right, sit on a chair, call your dog. It's, they, they, they panic. I say, you're not moving from that chair till your dog's sitting by your side. And all of a sudden their brain gets it and they just change. And, and I notice it and the dog notice it like, wow, what happened? And usually it's lowering their voice. And, and so they're saying things like, Rover, come. <laughs> they're asking questions of the dog. You know, come, an interrogative. They're dogs sniffing, playing with other dogs. Rover, come. Because they're embarrassed because they're on camera. Or in a workshop, I put them on the spot. Like, Rover, come here. And they say, he's not coming. I said, well, keep up. I said, you're sitting there till your dog comes. And they think about it and then they suddenly change and they go, Rover, come here. And the dog goes like that, at which point I explode behind them to help them out. He's looking at you, praise him. Pop, 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 pop. Can I call him, do something? Ah, pop, pop, pop. Like this. And the dog comes. I say, get him, sit, 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 sit. And I help them out. And the dog sits, say, take his collar, I say, well done. I put my hand on your head, on their head, and I say, you have the force in dog training. Your mind pulled that dog from distraction and moved it over here. But you see, what people miss is the first couple of steps. They miss the look. You got a reaction out of your dog. Now praise him and do something to get his attention. Roll on the ground, stick your legs in the air, squeak, you know, uh, have a squeaky toy with you. Let it go rip, strangle the squeaky cat so it thinks it's dying. You got to do something to get the dog to come. But you practice this first at home you know, indoors or in your yard, other dogs with the other dogs off leash. And then the really difficult one is most of the dogs are on leash, but one of the dogs is off leash. Why? You see, the dogs, if they're all off leash, they're soon going to learn that your dog's, you know, like there, he doesn't want to play. He's always paying attention to his owner. So they play with each other. But when they're all tethered as distractions, which can be a bigger distraction, especially if the owner's trained them to bark on cue and lunge to the ends of the leash, um, there's one dog that's not on the leash, he's going to come to your dog. 
So when you say, Rover, come, I want your dog to come and the other dog following it. You don't give up. So we're gradually building it up. Um, and then we'll go to other friends' yards or other fence places with other dogs. And you want to set up a training um, like core group five of you, five dogs, and you do this stuff together, you take turns. So now when you go to the dog park, you're going with your friends, you're probably gonna to play together, and they all know the recalls, and the five of you can all do the recall game. You all call your dogs at once, and the last person to get their dog has to pay for the beer after you've gone to the dog park, you know? And other people are watching you, and then you're advertising and broadcasting what we're talking about here to everyone in your community. And especially if you're wearing T-shirts with the name of your training company on, you know, luckily all of our dogs have to be vested when they go in public, but it all they all know where they come from, next step service dogs. And when they see what the dogs can do, you know, like, oh, I dropped my credit card, and Captain picks it up. And people are like, wow. How do you train a dog to do that? And I always say, well, first you have to be someone who always drops their credit card, uh, which Gina is, of course. But man, that dog was quick to pick up credit cards. You know, he was quick to try and get my wallet out of my back pocket too, but we discouraged that. So eventually you go to the dog park, but you're going into the dog park with a highly trained dog. That's the best possible training scenario. What's the worst possible training scenario? Well, the story at the beginning. You just go to the dog park and bite the bullet and you're going to teach your dog to recall tonight. You go in with his dinner in a bag and when you come out, your dog will have done, oh, 30 to 100 recalls. It's going to happen if you say it's going to happen. But you will have to wait until the dog's done his thing, you know, run back and forth, done the whirlies, hunt a few dogs, chased other dogs, been chased and stuff. And most dogs usually come and check in. At that point, you can show them the food and eat it yourself or give them five food treats in a row, but you walk away afterwards. Okay, you don't attempt to touch the dog, you know, until he's been come flies in and just does, you know, really good recalls there. So that, that's basically the approach. It's a lot of fun. And along the way, you just develop a different relationship. We throw away all of this, like, clinical approach to training, which is, I, I hate it. Um, it's the relationship has gone, the, the, the communication has gone, the voice has gone for, from training. I mean, starting in the 1900s when the, uh, you know, regularizing or formalizing leash training it reduced it to, well, it took out praise and continued guidance and ongoing instruction which was, say, how old time, you know, gun dogs, sheep herders, um, horse drivers would communicate with their animal. And it turned it into command, but no instruction and correction. And then for a short time, 20 years, lure reward training had its heyday, the glory days, um, 1980 to 2000. But then along comes clicker training, which eliminated instructions that early on, there were a lot of pure shapers that said, you shouldn't lure when you're shaping. You know, I thought, what are you talking about, guys? As a clinical exercise, yes, don't lure to check you can do it, which most people can't, but don't tell owners that. They'll never get anywhere. Tell owners to lure everything, you know, so they can see some progress. But what um, clicker training quickly removed was praise. I mean, it was a terrible side effect of the most wonderful training technique. And instead, praise was reduced with a click, a food treat, and usually the same click and the same food treat every time. We've got to put it back. Now, please don't misunderstand me. You know, I'm not slanging, you know, clicker training. I'm just stating a fact that it is not the only reward training technique. It's one of six really pretty good ones and i have them in rank order and for me shaping comes third 
I lure, reward, train everything. If it doesn't work, I wait and reward, train. If it's a really difficult behavior to teach, like retrieval to a non-retrieving dog, um, I still try doing it with my person, being silly. Um, but if it's really difficult, then it's shaped. You know, it's a very useful, and that's why I promoted clicker training in the 90s. The very first seminar when a clicker was used to train a dog, um, not many people signed up. So uh, Serious Puppy Training promoted it, and we got 200 people. And Gary Wilkes did the training, and Karen did all the talking. Why? Because this was a non-aversive alternative to the forced retrieve, squeezing the dog's ears, showing it a dumb I mean, how's the dog going to learn from that? But that was not a training technique. It was the default training technique to teach retrieve. So anyway, we've got to change it around. Talk to your dogs. Have dialogue with them. Tell them stories. And it's going to change all of that because, to me, the two centripetal commands that require proximity and closing, distance, following, and recalls um, are so important because they give you an insight into the relationship. A recall is a non-problem if you've trained your dog off leash from the outset and you engage with it. Right, and if, you're, if your dog wants to be near you. Yeah. That's that's the core of what we're really trying to do here, you know. So, yeah. Well, Dad, you did a, a really good job. Hey, saying one on topic and in a timely fashion. You yeah. deserve a cookie. I would say this is an uh, above average performance. So you get a treat, a treat. Yeah, yeah. I treat. mean, thank you, Jamie. But I'm sure your main criterion was speed or time. No, no, no. I was listening i think you covered all the uh the topics um but uh as promised now we'll open it up to questions sounds um, good there was one question that came in towards the end as you were talking about the worst case scenario going to the dog park um and then feeding your dog their dinner there wouldn't that attract other dogs in the dark dog park to you when you bring food there yeah i mean that can be a problem in some dog parks they don't allow food or toys and so I probably wouldn't use them. But it's why when I'm doing a lot of dog park stuff and a lot of dog dog reactivity stuff, I like to use a tug toy as a mega secondary reinforcer because um, other dogs may want the food or the tennis ball. And a lot of people get very shirty, you know, if, if that happens. So I go in with the tug toy it's always in my pocket. There's no other dog in the park that knows what it means. If I pull it out, people think, oh, he's got a tuck toy in his pocket. My dog says, whoa, the key to the city. If I take this and play tug, he'll let me get on the couch. He will give me the, that stake that I know is in his pocket. He will give, oh no, that's in the car because we can't bring it in the park. He will take time out to give me a little massage, you know. So in training, you've amped up your secondary reinforcers, whether it be a piece of kibble, very convenient, a tennis ball or a tug toy to be a mega secondary reinforcer. So you must get this concept, okay? Because I will amp up that tug toy, come, sit, tug, I'll say, hey, go chase the rabbits, chase the squirrels, buddy. I will amp it up by using the very problems we're trying to control. The only ones I wouldn't use would be like with Zuzu, it was deer chasing. The big difference is, you see, if you tell your dog to chase a squirrel, it's not going far. It's just going to the nearest tree. Squirrels go up trees, rabbits go down holes. So your dog is actually easy to get back. But with a deer, he's gone for three days. So I will amp up the mega secondary using the very problems that are, are ruining, you know, the, the dog's recall. Um, but the great thing is you can take it anywhere and no one knows what it is or what it means apart from your dog. The dog is the only person in the world that can read on the tug toy a million dollars or anything that that buys. Hours of massage, hours of butt sniffs, Go sniff, go chew. See, come, sit, tug, go sniff. 
come sit, tuck. Hey, go and hump that dog if you want. You know, the other dog doesn't mind and the other owner doesn't mind. So, yeah, sometimes we can't take food into the dog park, but then let's not go to that dog park and let's do it in a friend's yard or larger fenced area and we invite dogs that we know. And I always recommend that to nearly every talk I give. I said, your dog needs a core social group of people and dogs. And you too need a core social group of people that you see on a regular basis. You know, the last three years have been hard. And you can do it during shutdown. You know, as long as you're allowed out of your house, you can all walk six feet apart. I'll tell you what, if you have six foot leashes, you can measure 12 foot distances. So you're going on the same walk across the field. Whoops. <laughs> um, but you're 12 feet apart. It can always be done. I mean, I remember right after shutdown started, we gave a seminar about how to socialize your dog, a webinar uh, during COVID. And I came out with all of these solutions where socializing your dog with people is still so easily done without risking yourself to parvo and without, I mean, risking yourself to coronavirus and not risking your dog to parvo if it's a puppy. Yeah. It really, th these medical restrictions on training are no different than the restrictions for parvo. Yeah. Um, I'll just say, I just want to say, if you are enjoying, if you enjoy this webinar, we'd love your feedback. I know Facebook and YouTube both have ways to indicate you like something. If you did, uh, a thumbs up will, will give us the positive reinforcement we need to keep going and, and, and reinforce our behavior. So we appreciate that. Um, what about hounds? That nose takes over. I think the idea here being, you know, trying to proof a uh, dog that likes smelling against smells for a reliable reason. Yeah, the, the reward has to be go sniff. I mean, th this to me is basic puppy training in, in all of the things I've said. The food reward won't do it. You must phase it out. Why? What's the biggest reason to phase it out so you can replace it with much more powerful rewards? So what everyone has to do is to go home or you're at home write a list one through 10 of your dog's 10 favorite rewards in rank order. This is how you will amp up your secondary reinforcer. Have I frozen for you, Jamie? I frozen. Nope, you're something. looking good. Oh, good. Just ignore it. No, I'm not moving. It's like I'm bored with my own talk. It really upsets me when people Sorry. aren't interested and I don't look like I'm interested in what I'm doing now, whereas I'm really interested in what I'm doing right now, which is talking to all these wonderful people out there. Yeah. You know, I, I need a little screen that has the audience on it all cheering away and yeah, go Ian. Yeah. Give us another I try. Go. I do my so, best. sniffing. You got um, a lot of thumbs up if, if that helps. Okay. Sometimes when it comes to sniffing, mummy knows best. Okay, your Beagle, your Basset, your Bloodhound. I mean, they think they know best, but no. You can set things up and walk the walk before you walk it. And let's drop a few little pieces of food in metal capsules with holes in, just like we use for nose work. And we're going to hide them on the route. We know where they are. So when we get within 30 yards of them, we say, puppy, come here, sit. Good dog. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you where something really good is. All right. Go sniff. Go on. Go sniff. No, this way. This way. Come on. over here. Go, go on. To your right. To your right. Are you closer. Good, good dog. That's it. All right. Good. There it is. Good dog. And your dog has found a bit of cat poop <laughs> in a little container. And you pull it out and you say, mmm, is this, do you want it? No, let's put it, go, go to sleep now, but have a sniff. Yeah, that was good. All right, let's go. And we're we'll selling, by the way, Dunbar Academy official cat poop now, so. I actually, jokes apart, I thought of creating cat poop flavored treats. And, um, you know, I, I had a load of treats in my long history. We had zero calorie treats. You remember those? The sniff treats? The sniff treats, yeah. yeah 40,000 sniffs in a sniff dispenser. 
Oh. And they lasted for years. I still have them. And I, I actually tried one when I went down to my office last week. And I went, snits, whoa, they still work. Liver. And uh, we had zero calorie treats. And then we had automatically dispensed treats by the old uh, citronella collar. I knew the company and I said, guys, if you retooled this and sold it differently, I will write you a write up telling you this is a an olfactory reward collar. Number one, let's get rid of that because that upsets people. They think their dog's scared of it. Instead, let it go or like that. Okay, that's stupid. If your dog's scared of that, oh my God, what did you do in development? Did you prepare it for the hydraulic brakes? of a big truck? I don't think so. Your dog would jump out of his skin. Imagine a little collapsed shelty skin on the ground as the rest of the dog jumps to the moon when <laughs> goes off, you know? <laughs> anyway. We got a lot so of questions there. What we did, no, I'll just finish this story. Amy <laughs> Tan said, do you have nicer flavored treats? And I said, well, I'll ask the company. And I think I got, I can't remember what it was, a lavender flavored one. And then I thought, I'm going to try out a liver-flavored one. And watching it work, far more efficient than citronella. So we decreased that, and we changed the flavor. Lavender worked better than citronella for getting dogs to stop barking. And so how it works is, you see, the noise, the dog goes, what's that? Wow, lavender. Oh, I quite like that. But when it's liver... Not only does the dog sniff for longer, so bark less or not bark for longer, but the smell of the liver reinforces the silence and stopping barking. It was a brilliant device, but it got trashed by the public who says, oh, my dog's frightened by it. And I will say, by the stupidity of the company that produced it, they wouldn't listen to me. And the reason was, I think he wanted his son to write the behavioral blurb for it. Well, it was sold as an aversive product. So it was like, oh, no, I'm not going to buy that. A very useful product. Anyway, next question. Yeah, you're right, Jamie. I'll stick to questions. Questions only. Um, Have a little sign with a Q. And it means stick the next one to is questions. Just jackpot for Dr. Dunbar. Thank I you. I agree, you, Lisa. A very nice uh, webinar oh. today. Well done. Oh, thank you. Um, Mary Kate McKnight says she's raising a litter of Labradoodles for service work. This isn't about recalls, but do you have a week by week guide for socialization for neonates to eight weeks? Um, I don't really have it for that age, but I'm wondering. No, we well, we have it written down in uh, in um, the breeders' guide. The breeders I know breed. what you've got to do. You'll go online and you will Google um, the name Julie Case C A S E. And that will be ultimate canine training. I think it's K and the number nine. And you will look for her videos on uh, environmental enrichment and socialization for neonates. And it will blow your cotton pick in mind. So there's your, your schedule right there. I have never met any other trainer who is doing anything remotely like this. Do we have the the video from the Pet Summit? We don't have her video, no. Why don't you, what Jamie will do, he's gonna send you a link to the Pet Summit that um, I, I did this last Christmas, was it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, and you'll see not only, uh, I've got three videos on there, but you'll see Julie Case has two videos and they're just they're unbelievable here i'll so post it in the send our special link as I'll well post it oh yeah that's a good point oops yeah but uh, jamie will send you the specific link to the dog training summit you can still see it do they have to pay uh no they can sign up and i think it's set up so that you can sign up and you'll get access to it for a little while uh no, I don't think you have to pay. Yeah, but if you do, it wasn't much even when I did it, was it? So just sign up for the site. Don't sign up for all the extras. Just sign up to watch these videos, the presentations. There's how many, like 20 speakers or something? Yeah, 
Yes. Uh, here, I'll display our specific link, which would be, you're right, the one to use. Use uh, this link. Okay. Right. Another question. Thank you, Mary. Um, so back, it's back on topic. Chris asked, uh, if you're trying to do differential reinforcement for a recall, what criteria would you use when you don't know how far the dog is away? Think about the wilds of northeastern Ontario, where the dog could be hundreds of yards away or just behind a nearby building. Chris has been using whether the dog is running or walking or trotting when they come into view. What do you think yeah. about that? Well, you know, there's ways to do it now with technology available. And uh, the last chapter in my book is like, where do we go from here? And I've already written algorithms for this, for how an iPhone can train your dog for you with just a little AI chip, um, um, a uh, tr transponder on your dog's collar that the your iPhone can recognize whether that's your dog or where it is, whether you can see it or not, what your dog's doing, is that desirable or not? And it then gives you the appropriate dialogue, uh, which is my voice, which you listen to, and then you just copy what I say and how I say it. And um, because my brain, because I write algorithms for computers to train animals, my brain thinks like a computer algorithm. So you've got to be really yes or no or black and white with a computer. And you have these flow diagrams, reward the dog or praise the dog at this level or give I a do jackpot. Hope someday you are able to realize this dream, Dad. I when I I'm putting it in the book because I want it public domain knowledge that these are the ways to take training. Um, it won't destroy the relationship because there'll be relationship apps too. There'll be apps to train dogs on your computer screen so you can practice there whether you're rewarding. I mean, I, I recommended this to all the shock collar companies, oh, 20 years ago. So if you are an app designer out there and you want to get in on the ground floor, get in touch. Yeah. And uh, Ian will but, give you the algorithm. You just got to program it for us. Oh, the, the, we uh, have loads of algorithms, but these mine are reward only devices. Next uh, question, Dad. Just, Do you understand this one would you use the exact same thing for an x racing greyhound adding in a chase at end stage yeah oh yeah yeah i mean come on x racing greyhound we i would definitely play tug with it i would definitely drag the object you know and let it have fun that's what it loves doing um you could do what i did with omaha use a a, a fishing rod and then you have a, i actually had a kong on the end but you can use a tennis ball with a long uh, furry string and you can make this dance man. So you better make sure your dog's fit because he's been going, he'll be going left, right and making turns and what have you. Um, but actually less dangerous than what they do when racing, continually race in one direction. You know, they always break the same leg, you know, yeah. And so, you know, if you've got a dog that plays fetch and games like this, but I would teach the Greyhound fetch too and tug, you know, but the old thing on a fishing pole, you can make it dance out there. You know, it's on the ground. You flick it over here. You can flick it way over there. You have to watch people if you've got a weighted ball because it can really clunk them. Yeah. But absolutely. All right. Here's a quickie. Would you recommend using long leashes in rec in training recall? No. Um, what if you don't have access to confined outdoor space? Well, I would only use it as a fixed tether with like a screw that you put in the ground that then gives you, say, a 40-foot diameter on a 20-foot line. But the, the inherent dangers are the dog will tie his leg in the line, um, I just don't like them. I'd rather find a fence space um, and which there are several. Or if you say, well, I, oh, I don't know anyone who's got a big yard or I don't know a, an unused tennis court or I don't know, I don't know. I would just say, well, what are you doing with your dog then? Oh, we go on long walks off leash. I would say that do it there. 
no increased danger to what you're doing already, which I think is pretty stupid, walking the dog off leash in the wide open space with no recall. But since you're doing that every day, now train your dog on these walks. Last far, you've been lucky. You've always managed to get back home with your dog. One day you won't. So just train these on the walks in a wide open space. You well, know, I and think the there's probably some people who are, uh, I think, I think your advice that there's probably a confined fenced area that you can find in your area is probably accurate, but for some people that might be difficult to find. And it seems yeah. like the answer, you could use a long line, tether it to a place, be mindful of your dog getting tangled in it. Try this, ring up a dog trainer and say, oh, my core social group would love to rent your space for an hour. How about $200? You know, or we'd like to rent it, you know, for five hours in the week for $500. Mm -hmm. And they'd probably say, oh, yeah, God, five people coming to my location. I'm making money on the unused hours when I rented this place. I didn't realize it was going to be empty for most days yeah. of the week, you know. And so there's always a space out there. Um, but that, that costs money. Um, no, there's always a space out there. Usually, you may have to drive that usually you can use for free. Friends are the best resource. Friends, you know, most people have one friend who has a, a yard. You know, um, you do have places, though, in parts of the country where fences are not permitted. Um, so see how people train their dogs there and where. And it may be they do it in suburban areas off leash. I, I don't know. I just love fences. I think they make for great neighbors. Just seems like a, a long line could be a very easy way to practice in an outdoor environment without the risk of your yeah. dog running off. With it out at bolting one at a time, the dog coming back to you. But you must not have your hand on the end of the line Right. either it's Tether. attached to you because you'll use it to tug the dog yeah. in so you can teach the dog off leash principles for control as long as you are not touching the leash but here's what happens to the human brain as soon as we put a leash or a tether on a dog they turn off that part of the brain that watches and gives feedback to the dog even in a good off leash puppy class if I say, right, we're going to practice walking on leash, we're all going to go through these doors, this door, the next door, outside, round that oak tree, and then back through this door and that door. Off you go. Space out five yards, and the dogs are terrible. These are dogs which can do it off leash in this room. But as soon as you put the leash on, the owner just doesn't give feedback, doesn't pay attention. It's unbelievable. So... That would be my one concern, and the second concern would be the leash ties around the dog's leg. I mean, some of these some of these lines are forty foot long. So, All right. But, yep. Try it if it's Baywolf. Baywolf says hi. Wow. Hey, Baywolf. I think that's Rocket. Hi, Rocket. Rocket. Thanks for watching. Okay, yeah. this is a good one. I think this is going to be a, very interesting. By one. the way, yeah. we should tell everyone that Baywolf is a pretty damn good magazine. It's online only now. But it's got some good authors. I read it every month. Um, I love it. And we all love Rocket. We do. Uh, Wade says, if the reward for recall at a dog park is continuing to play, why is the dog motivated to come at all? Why doesn't it just keep playing? Um, no dog would just keep playing. I mean, we have unlimited play sessions here where I'm just, I, I don't want to train the dog today. So I say, who wants to go down? And I'll take three dogs down, let them off leash, crack a beer, light my cigar up and watch them. Um, now I should say I live in Escondido. And so uh, they only have 15 minutes playing the max when it's 85 degrees in the evening. But no dog plays forever. They just don't. Even in the course of play, if you've ever watched play, which I have for 10 years, um, they have timeouts, many timeouts to reaffirm that we are playing. One dog will just pause for an instant. The other dog respects that, backs off, usually shakes it out. They both have a shake, then they stand there, and then an electric play appeasement gesture will come, like, Choo! 
and like this, or they move their heads, and then they're together again playing. But eventually, no, they lie down and go to sleep. You know, dogs can't play forever. And right, but I don't think the question is about whether the dog's going to play forever. It's about how we're suggesting people incorporate go play as a reward for a good recall, right? Okay, well, let's answer it this way then. Instead of saying, why is the dog motivated to come and sit at all? Well, let's forget motivation. They all do. They all eventually go back to the owner, and the owner gets this crazy dog that's totally disinterested in them and only interested in playing back. What I'm saying is start training then so you can motivate the dog to want to come to you. And you have to teach your dog that you are more fun here than what they're doing over there. Well, for 99.99% of owners, including me, that's impossible. You can't compete with sniffing grass, sniffing rectums, and playing with other dogs. So they have to be rewards in your toolbox. So when they come, yeah, I can be pretty fun and pretty silly, but ultimately the reward has to be go play. Now, as you do this, after about three and four visits to the dog park, you'll find the dog will check in on you sooner. In fact, time this, quantify it. When's the first time my dog came back to me and sat and I could take his collar? Um, and I've known owners where it's taken a full hour. All right, yeah, but about three visits to the park doing what I'm suggesting, now it's only five minutes. So quantify it, graph it out, and you'll find that these times are reducing rapidly until eventually I want you to be able to go in the park and say, Rover, sit, you good dog, and stay. You take the dog off leash. Then you say, Rover, go play. Rover, sit. That quickly, you're going to stop the play session. Or Rover, come here. You know, and of course you practice it at home first, but that's what we want. And because you've said sit or come here, now the dog has to do it. And so, you know, eventually as you learn this, you'll learn non-aversive means to enforce compliance without force. But once you've set a command, if you want a reliable dog, you just have to promise yourself, if you say one of these important commands, like come or sit or down, uh, you must enforce it by following up, by insisting. You don't have to get angry, you don't have to raise your voice, but you must insist and you don't give up till your dog sits. And when it does, you say, thank you. Like that, sarcastically. Now the dog has to repeat the whole exercise because he made you through you jump through hoops to get him to sit. So you're going to say, Rover, come here and sit. Good dog. Okay, go play, do your thing. It, it's just as simple as that, that the playing is motivating. I want to use it for a reward. So it will yeah, come. I think I think it in thinking about this more like right what you're pointing out is like the dog is motivated to come to you for all sorts of reasons. Yeah. You know, you have a relationship with the dog and what we're trying to get rid of is the fact that most people, you know, the, the dog comes and then that's the end of the play session and so now there's a reason for them to not come to you. You're ruining the motivation for coming to you, which hopefully is there for many reasons. Yeah. And you 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 know, when you go to dog parks, there's really two big types of dog there, two major classifications. Dogs that ignore their owners because the owners are ignoring them because they're checking their iPhone. And all they do is play with other dogs. And that's the prime reason they come to the park. Or you've got dogs which are interacting with their owners and fetching tennis balls or coming up and playing tug or coming up. And, I mean, I've seen integrated training in dog parks. And whenever I see it, I go up to the owner and I say, thank you for doing this. I say, you, you, it's a joy to watch you train your dog. Um, I don't tell them no, let them know who I am or that I came up with a concept of you have to integrate training interludes into <laughs> enjoyable activities. Otherwise, the enjoyable activity becomes a distraction. So, and, and that's, you know, one of the major goals of the, the if you like, step two of lure reward training is now using all these much more powerful rewards you know because your treat isn't going to work in the dog park you know unless you've 
always integrated training and eating a treat in the dog park was the status quo. That's what we did in training class. That's what we did at home. Yeah. All right. I think maybe one more question and then we'll say goodbye. Uh, Rosario says, uh, when we are spacing recalls, I understand we shouldn't do rewards in between repetitions, but can we say good job every time? Or um, is that also a reward? Once you get to, like when you want the rapid part, okay, building up for the reliable part, I wouldn't phrase that say good job each time if it's not a good job. If it truly is a good job every time, then by all means, say good job. Um, in terms of giving a reward like a, a food reward or a short game of tug, I'd be very judicious about that, that this has to be a really good reward. So, you know, when you say you shouldn't, when you're spacing recalls, you shouldn't do rewards in between repetitions. No, you can if you like. The question is building up. How many repetitions can you do without the necessity of you rewarding the dog to keep it going? Now, because people don't test themselves and stretch their dogs on that, they can't even do one. Come here, treat, and their dog won't sit. Or they can only do one. Come sit, and the dog's off. It's one behavior, one reward. And, and that is the silliness rather than the insanity of a lot of training these days. So you get dogs that have very staccato performances. You know, high five, treat. You know, roll over, treat, and so on. How, but if you look at a really good, say lure reward trainer or, or clicker trainer, like the people who perform routines on TV, they've strung together probably a hundred different, you know, responses in one routine on the telly. And the dog's yet to get a single food treat, you know. And the dog's doing it, why? He loves dancing with his owner because the owner's smiling, laughing, and dancing back with him. See, a dog will play with you just as enjoyably or as much as they will play with other dogs if you do it. So always look at behavior. Like Here's a great way to explain one of the most effective reinforcement schedules there is, better than fixed interval, fixed ratio, variable interval, variable ratio, total random reinforcement. Go out with 10 food rewards today, reward your dog at random. But before you consider giving a reward each time, invoke what I call the, the quality, um, oh damn, what's it called? Um, veto. So before you reward, give one of these 10 rewards each time, you ask, is it really worth one of my 10 rewards I have on my person each day? But you're rewarding at random, no thought required. Do it at whim, but invoke a quality veto and you will have a dog whose responses are as reliable, if not far more reliable than people that have put all this thought and theory in it and have become clinical and all that stuff. No, have joy, play, dance through the dog park. I mean, this is, as I get older, and, you know, I'm sure someday I'll be pushed around by Jamie in a wheelchair to, do you want to go for a walk, Dad? And you'll push me outside. What would bring joy to my heart would be to see anyone with the dog off leash, dancing down the sidewalk, skipping, laughing, and the dog stuck to the owner like Velcro, you know, and then stopping and doing a long downstay, you know, just really enjoyable off leash training. It would just make me chuckle and I would smile and then have another slug on my whiskey bottle that I hope Jamie would let me have when I get old. I'll put it, I'll put it in a baby bottle so you can suck a lot. Yes. <laughs> oh, I would love that. I get to suck on it too. Yeah. Well, I want to say thank you to everyone who stuck with us this whole time. And um, once again, mention, if you'd like to learn more about any of these concepts, check out our free trial of the Top Dog Academy. And uh, we really appreciate you joining us. And I would like to give a word of appreciation after I just plead and beg anyone out there, you know, um, 
please start spreading the word about Dunbar Academy. Ian's moving into promotion phase now, um, but it also means at the same time, I shall be creating so much more um, information, product, call it what you like. What do we call it, Jamie? Information. Content. Content, that's the word I was looking for, yeah. And um, I've learned to edit video again to do this. You know, I have my camera. I just bought a brand new iPhone so I can film vertically for Instagram and TikTok, as it you said, Jamie. Well done, yes. Um, but it's it's really good now. It will get bigger, but I'm moving into oh. promote way. So please help me to spread the word. But above all, thank you for listening today. It's so lovely to see familiar names crop up. I can only see if my glasses on and I can only see a few because they go so quickly. So I appreciate you for coming. Next time, let's have, you know, 10 of your friends there. Yeah. You know, have your more... core social group at home while we're giving the webinar. Let's yeah. get back to what life was about. Also, one last thing. Tomorrow, we're doing another live session. This one's going to be a little bit more casual. Me, you, and Kelly at 12.30 Pacific time. Oh. I and don't... we're making an exciting announcement. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, damn. There we are. I nearly let the cat out of the bag. Yeah. I heard you kind of did. Yeah, but no, I didn't. I didn't finish. I, I, I heard you let out the first couple of continents. Um, anyway, yeah. tomorrow, anyway, exciting I, I announcement better. coming live on a uh, another live stream. So I'll post the. Uh, I better write that down in my. That's what I'm should. doing now. I it haven't. Be helpful if you were there. So yeah, that's I J K. What it? What it? What is it on? Is it a Zoom or? It'll you, be the same thing. So it'll be streamed on Facebook, streamed oh. on YouTube. FBYT. There we go. Good. I'll be there. Yeah. And this is just casual about catching up, what we've been doing in our lives. Boy, it's been a long, long time. Indeed. I look very unfortunate the way I'm frozen there. Uh, this is, it's, uh, it's frozen on my chair. This is what I look like. Actually, I look like an actor. What's his name? I know. You know the actor who played um, Zorba in Zorba the Greek? I look like him, but I don't have the suntan, and my face is warped. It's like this. Well, fortunately, you don't like look like that to me. And Well, now you do. Oh, well, yeah. I was... <laughs> but you... That's why this has been disturbing. You weren't looking like that before. All right. We'll sign off. We yeah. People wanting more. Okay, uh, everybody. Thank you, everyone. See you next time. Yeah. Bye. Bye, Dad. Oh, two weeks we do the next webinar, don't we? We'll announce it. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. We'll tomorrow's it. informal one. And then Jamie yeah. will announce it. Good. You'll let me know too when it is. I'll definitely <laughs> let you know. All right. Bye, Dad. Oh, I hate myself at times. Bye, everyone. Bye, Jamie. Miss you.